Thank you very much, Juan, and uh, dear Working Party members. Um, I'm here today to give you an update where we stand with the safety surveillance on the COVID-19 vaccines. And on the next slide, please, just to, um, to reflect uh, a bit more again, we have behind us a year of very strong surveillance, intense work by the whole network, but also across the globe in, in the framework of our international collaborations and, uh, and with a lot of stakeholder engagement, last not least, uh, regular updates here to your working parties. We also managed to push out 44 vaccine safety updates, which specifically came to, from our office and pharmacovigilance, in addition to all the, the wonderful and intense uh, transparency and communication uh, um, initiatives uh, Marco already uh, briefly mentioned as well. So uh, obviously what we want to achieve and uh, I think we have, we have done well is to not only identify risks but also give advice to patients uh, or to vaccinees in fact what to do, what to watch out for in order to keep themselves um, safe after a vaccination. So on the next slide and just to give you an idea, we had um, we had more received uh, more reports received from adverse drug reactions for the four vaccines uh, as we ever had for all centrally authorized products in in a given year. So um, so we are currently having uh, more than a million cases uh, for the vaccines in the database, and uh, you have to to know that Utah Vigilance holds less than 20 million cases. So so that's a lot. Uh, sorry, 10 million cases, 20 million, almost 20 million of reports. So um, so you can see the the relationship between uh, how, how many reports we got, and uh, a lot of these reports, more than half, are actually coming. Uh, from uh, consumers, vaccinees directly. So um, you also see that uh, obviously the amount of adverse reactions uh, reported, suspected adverse reactions we receive is in relation to, to the, uh, mainly in relation also to the exposure, to the use of the, the vaccine, although we see here a little bit um, higher reporting rate for Vaxevria, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine. So on the next slide, we can also see that we uh, did use um, a strategy uh, very much adapted to, um, to, to the data we got in, because this was rapid uh, deployment of vaccines, um, uh, like in many people, during a public health emergency. So that has a lot of specifics how you actually conduct safety surveillance. So we used our well-established tools and tailored them to this situation. And we looked um, in, into patterns of certain um, report, certain suspected reactions which were reported to us. We looked into patterns. We looked into numbers, into quantity, into comparisons vis-a-vis -vis the exposure, vis-a-vis -vis the expected uh, rates of such uh, events happening to people. And uh, so we, we, we had a, uh, various tools to do so. Now, in the next slide, you can see that uh, together with these methods and also coordinated studies uh, by EMA and also obviously all the publications we get from, from, from academia and healthcare professionals publishing in the scientific literature, that's basically our body of evidence which then uh, translates or is used in, in regulatory procedures. And that is within our task force uh, specifically established at EMA for the COVID-19 crisis, the PRAC, the Risk Assessment Committee. We have signal procedures. We have uh, various procedures for assessment of all data and timely transparency on the outcomes is absolutely key for us. Um, obviously, the marketing authorization holders have their very strong role to play with risk management plans, pediatric investigations plan, um, summary safety update reports at regular intervals, and also conducting studies longer term. Now, this all together led, on the next slide please, did lead us to, um, to identifying in the post-authorization phase a number of 
uh, adverse reactions for which we could give very specific advice. And uh, this looks like a very busy slide, but in fact, um, there are not so many, um, many symptoms and signs to actually watch out for. So we could probably reduce this to a, to a checklist of, of 10 things um, vaccinees would have to be aware of before and after vaccination. And, uh, and then also get quick treatment should any of these um, adverse reactions truly develop in, in them. So um, on the next slide, please. Um, just to, to these are the latest data now. Uh, we have um, collect well, yeah, from, from, from end of January, these are the, the exposure data. And uh, you can clearly see we have the majority of exposure here in the mRNA vaccines, lesser exposure to the to the vector vaccines, and not yet uh, any use. I think it just started this week for Novavaxovid. So, so this means that we also have to adapt now our our for this year. Um, the way how we survey uh, the safety of these vaccines according to, to the exposure, like how they are used, who they are using, um, because we need, obviously, now we are looking basically at very rare reactions. So you need a certain amount of, of, uh, of data in order to find patterns for very rare things. So we have to, to adapt to, to the data influx. On the next slide, please. You will see that this is uh, this was this was was what we did the last couple of weeks. We um, we looked at how, how when we will get data in what are useful timetables to also use our resources very effectively, and uh, we also have looked into how we process how we can organize the work processes for sustainability because just as Marco highlighted, we will vaccinate still for a long time. We will continue our efforts to, to look into safety, but we also need to look at sustainability in the larger picture of all other diseases and our work overall. Um, we continue international collaboration as we did last year, and also our engagement with the public uh, does continue exactly the same or maybe even more. Um, now, um, obviously, the special populations are really now also in the uh, yeah, in the foreground. And on the next slide, please, um, I want to, to inform you what we're currently looking at uh, specifically. Uh, we had a couple of reports on autoimmune hepatitis, not, not many at all, um, for the mRNA vaccines. We also look uh, for the mRNA vaccine of potentially capillary leak syndrome, which is already um, known for uh, for the other vaccines could, could if we, we have to do something we will look into data from scientific literature here is not yet sure if there is a causal relationship and we have also reopened um, our investigations into menstrual disorders um, there we had a um, for all four vaccines, we have looked at data uh, intensively last year, and we haven't uh, seen evidence for a causal relationship between vaccination and menstrual disorders. But there have been some um, new uh, population-based studies, um, and it's not easy, obviously, to find um, uh, potentially small increases in something which is actually a quite common disorder. And so far, we haven't seen any specific pattern. So we see uh, either um, uh, a, sh uh, a stop of, of menstruation or, or slightly heavier menstruation. But the important message is that it's actually short-lived. So after a few cycles, things are back to normal. That's what we have seen currently also from self-reported cases from women. Um, we haven't seen any sign for impact on, on um, uh, fertility or conception. And, uh, and as Marco has just highlighted, uh, it's actually really important to become vaccinated uh, because it's, it's a huge advantage in pregnancy for both mother and child. And, uh, and also um, the child also benefits from, from being protected uh, with antibodies after vaccination. Yeah born to a mother who has been vaccinated. So there are a lot of benefits, but we are clearly taking this very serious because it's important to inform women and to know what they what they potentially could expect if that is a causal relationship and also how to deal with it then. So on the next slide, we'll see um, just coming back on, on the data, pregnancy breastfeeding. So we had really a large amount of uh, data now to look at. And um, uh, so we currently couldn't, uh, yeah, we 
me. We can only say that uh, all data hint to show us that uh, the vaccine is safe. Uh, it can be safely used both in pregnancy and breastfeeding. And uh, this has actually also been specifically mentioned now in the product information recently updated. Now, on the next slide, um, what I really want to yeah, just uh, inform you also is that for these safety updates this year, we have chosen a new format. So last year, the format was um, safety updates um, by, uh, by each product. And that was because we want to be very flexible to uh, as data came in for the different vaccines to, to issue always the latest uh, vaccine, per, uh, sorry, the latest report by vaccine product. And uh, so now we have seen that we are um, in a more stable position about what uh, data will come in and um, how, how, how big our safety database now is also in the post authorization phase. So we thought it's much easier to have now uh, a monthly report which covers all vaccines and uh, it, should there still be any need for ad hoc communication in between then we obviously have our regular tools to immediately inform the public so this is now the new format we had one in january february and uh, this will now come also next month again and we continue with that uh, uh, yeah, uh, for, for at least a couple of months more, and we will reassess the situation also how we can best inform you um, and in, in the next, uh, well, towards the end of the year, next year as well. So um, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, this is something I want to, to, um, to actually, uh, I hope we'll have a couple of minutes maybe to discuss even. Um, we spend a lot of time on the communication, also looking at what to put in the product information for vaccinees, but actually the product information never really reaches any, I mean, I've been vaccinated, I've never seen any package leaflet. I mean, if, if I don't go online as a, as, a, as a person, I mean, and read for myself in healthcare, you actually don't get the information. You get a sheet from the vaccination campaign, which may have some information. So here it's really, I think, just to, to remind all of us, we need really to work together um, that, uh, that those who, who, who should know before what to watch out for, what to, to tell the, the, the vaccination center or what to watch out afterwards, we really need this very strong communication in healthcare and, and we are obviously ready to stand here to, to support and to, to identify what needs to be shared with the patient, but it needs to be rolled out, so to say. And on the next slide, please, um, my, my last one, I just want to really reassure you, we are, um, after one year of strong surveillance, we're not giving up, we are, we are continuing um, this year, uh, as we did last year, 24-7, basically, but we also don't lose sight of all the other medicines. We were able to maintain the high pharmacovigilance standards for all medicines, all patients, no matter what medicines they need. We obviously had to uh, slow down on some pharmacovigilance work, for example, in the policy area. We are progressing, but maybe not as much because we have to reshuffle resources, but, um, but really reassuring that we are uh, we are keeping this very strong surveillance. Um, with that, I would like to uh, close and uh, open up for the questions. Thank you.